welcome to Belgrade Online. We're glad you decided to join us today. I'm Jody, and I'll be your host. Here at Belgrade, we hope to encourage you in your journey and explore what that means in new and beautiful ways. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode. Up next, announcements. Then we will see who's having birthdays and anniversaries this week. After that, we will hear from the pastor, the scriptures, and let the spirit move you with some music. Before I come back to see you off. Welcome to Belgrade Online. Join us for Holy Week 2022. Sunday, April 10th is Palm Sunday. We will have palm branches and the kids will play bells during the in-person service. Maundy Thursday, April 14th at 6 p.m. will be a dinner and communion time with Pastor Crandall. Please RSVP by Sunday, April 10th if you would like to participate. A prayer vigil will begin following the Maundy Thursday event and run through to just before our Good Friday service, which is at 7 p.m. on April 15th. Finally join us as we rejoice his resurrection on Easter Sunday outside at Wheeler Park at 10 a.m. weather permitting. Invite your family and friends and come join us for Holy Week 2022. The non-sermon series continues. <laughs> so for Lent, I gave up sermons. So we're just talking about some scriptures, and I've, I've chosen a few scripture passages for the month of Lent every week, that, uh, passages that I've, that I've taught before, and so I haven't written a sermon. It's just sharing some scriptures. I'm giving you some background of the scripture and kind of showing you the, just the, the meaning of that scripture. And then I'm kind of just leaving it open and open-ended for you to draw your own conclusions on how to, to put that to practice in your own lives. And so um, one of my favorite things to do, because uh, I'm a Bible teacher at heart, those of you that have been around here for, for since I've come here for almost three years ago now, um, know that, <laughs> know that I, I love to dig into the scriptures and I can be kind of a geek when it comes to the history and, and the, the, the original language and I love the Greek and the Hebrew and, and first century culture and ancient Near Eastern culture and all that um, because I feel like a lot of times we, we read the scriptures and, you know, we, we see them at face value but we forget that they didn't come down to us on a puffy cloud last year in Wisconsin. You know, <laughs> they're, they're very old and they were given in a specific time uh, to a people with specific cultures. Um, and uh, a lot of times they were written for specific reasons. But when we are, are separated from the culture of when they were written, we tend to get some weird ideas and we assume things and we read things into the scriptures that aren't there without realizing it. Um, and so I love, I love kind of busting through those walls and really getting down and, and making the scriptures accessible to all of us, whether we're not, even if we've never cared about theology or church or anything like that. Because in the original context, a lot of the, the stories in the scriptures were, were pretty, uh, pretty scandalous, and they packed a big punch. And there's a reason... There's a reason why when Jesus finally comes on the scene, the people that really take to him are those that are not religious, mostly. The ones that are religious don't like him. And I love that about Jesus because I've never been really religious, you know. I, I love God and I, and I feel like I've always been very spiritual, but religion hasn't ever interested me too much. And so um, this morning, this scripture is, once again, like a lot of the scriptures I talk about, is extremely misunderstood. And um, I, I, I don't know that I've, I've ever met anyone outside of a seminary that has understood this scripture correctly. 
It's usually always, always misunderstood. And that scripture is, um, you've usually heard it, when Jesus cleanses the temple or when he overturns the money changers' tables in the temple and, and uh, drives out the money changers and stuff. And so um, I wanted to talk about that scripture this week because it's powerful. So I'm going to read it to you and then we'll pray for the sermon and then we'll just talk about it a bit. And then we'll take communion at the end. So here's our scripture for the week. This is Matthew chapter 21, verses 10 through 17. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things that he did, and they heard the children crying out in the temple, praising, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this scripture, Jesus this is at the end of his, of his, towards the end of his ministry. See, next week is, is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday is usually the, the, the time that we uh, remember the, this point at the end of Jesus' ministry when he comes to Jerusalem and he comes into the temple and people are throwing palms at his palm branches down and coats down and they're shouting Hosanna, you know, recognizing him as, as their king. And, and we've, we've talked about that, that passage, uh, you know, we usually do that every year on, on Palm Sunday, but... This year, I wanted to look at what he actually did when he went into Jerusalem. And I know Paul's Sunday's next week, but we're going to do it in two parts, because there's two parts, two scriptures that really talk about this. And we'll do one next week, and then uh, this one we'll do this week. And so, basically, Jesus is at the end of his ministry, and he's coming into Jerusalem, like, like any king would. At, you know, they, they come into their kingdom, and people are, are praising, praising them, and, and, um, Jesus is coming here, and the first thing he does when he gets to Jerusalem is he goes to the temple. Because the temple, you know, the temple is, wasn't like a church is nowadays. The temple was like the center of religious life, but it was also the center of political life. It was the center of social life. It was the center of economic life. Because, the, the, you know, civilization didn't have everything that we have today. Um, and so the, the temple was like the centerpiece of that community. But not only that, it was also the centerpiece of an entire people group that had been scattered throughout the entire regions um, of, of the, the eastern, uh, eastern uh, ancient Near East and, and certain parts of Europe and northern Africa. And people, the, those Israelites had been scattered all around. And so this temple had become globally known. It was a big deal. And the keepers of the temple from the Old Testament were supposed to be the priests. They were supposed to be from this specific genetic line, a line from, from, you know, the story of Moses. There's Moses and Aaron. You know, Aaron, Aaron's genealogy, um, if you were in Aaron's genealogy, you were eligible to be a priest in the temple. And the priest, there's all kinds of laws set up to to take care of the priests and things like that. And the priest, the priest's role was to minister God to the people and then to present people to God and basically have one hand on each and just go like that. Um, the temple was the place where it was believed that heaven and earth overlapped, that God's space and human space sort of shared a little bit, and the veil between the two was thin. It was when, it was, it was when that divine, the, that weight, that meaningful presence could be felt more clearly. And what had happened, though, was over the centuries, the temple had become sort of a place not necessarily for rest and rejuvenation 
and ministering to people and, you know, a place where people could have their guilt and their shame washed away. And instead, it became a place of status, as we'll see. And by the time Jesus comes on the scene, there's these, there's these all kinds of different temple authorities that weren't necessarily priests that were running the show. There was Pharisees and there was Sadducees and there was temple authorities and there was scribes and these different kinds of authorities that, have, that God didn't necessarily ordain for them to run it. And they're all setting up and, and these different groups weren't all necessarily bad, but there was a certain, certain power-grubbing section of each one of these groups that were the ones that were kind of in charge. And they were sort of the thorn in the side of Jesus' entire ministry. And so we talked a little bit about that last week, about some of those and, and how Jesus sort of opposed them last week. But here, this, this, now, knowing that background, so we come to the scripture, and we have Jesus in verse 12, it says, well, excuse me, back up in verse 11, it says, we can put that up on the screen, we can kind of have the app on the screen, and I'll just walk you through it so you can kind of see what I'm talking about at the same time. So at the very beginning of Matthew 21, it says, Jesus enters the temple courts, but before that, in the verse before it, in verse 11, when Jesus enters the town, the whole place is in turmoil. And they're asking who it is. Who's this guy that's showing up? And the crowds were saying, not this is the Son of God, but in Matthew here, the writer Matthew, he, he makes a point to say that the people were saying, the prophet Jesus. The prophet Jesus. Because Jesus was the Son of God, but he was also the prophet now, in the scriptures, there's, those little details matter because if you were, if you were educated enough to, to be able to read and write and you were there at the moment and you, when all this stuff happened and you were a part of the story and you had the finances to write an account of this, which was a big undertaking back then and very expensive to write an account like the book of Matthew or Luke or John or something, um, Every word mattered. And to an ancient Israelite, the order that you told a story in said just as much as the words themselves. And the specific words used. Everything had meaning. And so he, Matthew, the writer here, makes a point to say the prophet Jesus. And that's kind of a clue on how to, how to read the rest of the verses. But we're going to come back to that in a minute. And then he says in the next verse, so we've got the prophet Jesus... And the next verse, he says, Then Jesus entered the temple. And that's the second clue. So the focus right away at the beginning of this story is we're supposed to see Jesus' actions here as a prophet would have acted in the Old Testament. And the setting for this is the temple. So Jesus, the prophet in this story, acting like a prophet in the temple. And what did he do? It says he drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he drove them out and he said, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. Now, this is the, this, this is the most misunderstood part of the story because people will use this. Uh, people basically use Jesus overturning the tables for whatever pet view we, we happen to have, you know, because in this, in this story, it's usually talked about like Jesus is, uh, these people are robbing or they're selling something in, in the church or they're, it's like some sort of economic injustice. They're robbing people of money economically. But that's actually not what's happening here. Um, this really doesn't have anything, what Jesus is getting angry about here is really nothing to do with money, actually. Because as he's entering the temple, um, he's seeing those, it says he drove out all those who, was, who were selling and buying. So if he was just as, he was showing anger just as much as those who were buying as, as those who were selling. So what they were doing in the temple, they weren't ripping people off, they weren't overcharging folks. Matter of fact, um, common in that day was, and this goes all the way back to, to the book of Leviticus, when you came to the temple, especially for a festival or something, and you were going to present a goat or a dove or, or some sort of animal to be sacrificed, um, that animal had to be free of blemishes. 
And so what, they, what the system they set up is that if you, you didn't bring your own animal, you'd come to the temple and you'd buy an animal there that was blemish-free so that, you know, if you're walking on the way, you know, a four or five day journey or whatever to the temple, and it's very likely that your animal might get a blemish. And so if you just come to the temple and buy an animal at the temple, you'd be assured that it's free of blemish, and then so these animals were raised to be sacrificed. It's a barbaric system. Um, and so it was helpful to people, and, ima- and this was happening in the temple. But see, there's also a lot of this stuff going around outside of the temple. And the ones that were overcharging and ripping people off were actually outside of the temple. The ones that sold these animals inside the temple actually weren't making much of a profit at all just to cover their own costs, and they weren't getting rich off of this stuff. It was actually honorable what these money changers and what these uh, people selling animals in the temple were doing. So why is Jesus so angry about it? And those, it says he overturned the tables of the money changers. Well, the money changers weren't turning a profit either. The money changers were simply, because the people of Israel had been scattered all over, all over the known world, currency was very different. So it was basically just like a exchange kind of, a, a, you're exchanging one currency for another. And they weren't making any money off that. That was also a good thing and it was an honorable thing. And then it said he, he overturned the seats of those who sold doves. Well, doves were sacrificed on behalf of the poor so that the poor could know that they had a sense of forgiveness as well. And the, the poor were outside of the temple courts and they couldn't afford to buy sacrifices. So people would buy doves and sacrifice on behalf of the poor. Again, it's barbaric, but it's a kind gesture in that way of thinking. So none of this was bad. So what's Jesus getting all mad about? Because these people aren't doing anything to hurt others. They're not making a profit or ripping people off. They're within their own frame of mind. They feel like they're doing something good for the less fortunate. What's going on here? So Jesus, the first thing, like I said, we'll go back to a minute ago when we said he's known as a prophet and he's entered the temple. One thing that a prophet would do is a prophet was known at, you know, you could say a protest, but protests now are pretty watered down because people get all angry about even the slightest bit of protest because it makes them feel uncomfortable. But back, if you think any protest now gets you uncomfortable, you would not have liked Jesus because he stood in the tradition of ancient Hebrew prophets and they would do crazy things to protest injustice. They would do, you'd call it guerrilla theater. They would put on a spectacle. They would go absolutely wild with the, the dramatic things that they would do to get attention and draw attention to an injustice. In theological circles, we call this prophetic acts. And so the, the writer here is saying that Jesus is noted as a prophet. It's saying what he's about to do is a prophetic action. It's saying something about injustice. And so, then the next part, when it says he entered the temple, it has in the next ver- in the, like the next breath, it's basically saying that this prophetic act, pointing out injustice, is having to do with the temple system. So it's something to do with the temple, and it's something to do with injustice. And he's over. He's he's driving out those who were selling and buying in the temple, overturning the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Now, if he was trying to chastise or rebuke the people, it it wasn't a very good rebuke because the moment Jesus left, they would just pick up their tables, put everything back, and keep on going. And there were temple authorities there and Roman guards there as well that if there was too much of a ruckus, they'd arrest the person. And they'd take him away for disturbing the peace. So what Jesus did wasn't that crazy of a thing. He didn't actually, he made a whip and he's cracking a whip, but he's not actually hurting anybody. He's not whipping anybody. He's just making a scene. What he's doing is, this this is a prophetic act. It's like a thing of protest. He's causing a scene because that's what prophets did to draw attention. And so what he's doing, he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, these, this is, that statement is two direct quotes from two different Old Testament passages. Um, 
And to make this as simple as possible to un- and as understandable as possible, have, do you, can you think of any sayings, popular sayings, or popular stories that all you have to do is, is say one part of it and in other people's minds you recall the whole thing? Like take, for instance, if there's a saying, if, if you're in a conversation or something and you get to the end and, you know, well, you can lead a horse to water. I don't need to say the whole thing because we all know the whole thing, right? You know, or, you know, something like that. I could go on, but you get the picture. So a lot of times, whenever Jesus, Jesus or somebody in the New Testament quotes a part of the Scripture, they're invoking not just that phrase, but the entire story to go with that phrase, which a lot of times we're not familiar with, but his hearers were. And so in those two, these, these are two passages from the Old Testament. The first one, my house shall be called a house of prayer. This is from Isaiah chapter 56, and we'll put this up here. We'll put this, this scripture up here. And so Isaiah chapter 56, it says, for this is what the Lord says. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument, a name better than sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This is talking to eunuchs. And foreigners who join themselves to the Lord and minister to him to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants and all who keep the Sabbath and don't profane it and hold fast my covenant. So eunuchs and foreigners, these I'll bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for, say it with me, all nations. Thus says the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them also who are not already gathered. Okay, so what's, what's, why is Jesus invoking that story? He's invoking, he's not saying that the temple you should pray there and shouldn't buy or sell anything there. That's not what he's saying. This whole story that he's invoking from Isaiah 56 is a, is a pivotal moment in Israel's history where the keepers, of the, the keepers of religion, those who were supposed to be representing God, those people were ministering to the elite and they were pushing away those who had blemishes, just like animals, like you couldn't sacrifice an animal who had a blemish. They were treating people in the same manner. And so, if you were a eunuch, you didn't have all of your body. So you were, you were not, you had a blemish, and you weren't allowed to come inside the temple. If you were a foreigner, you weren't pure Israel. You weren't part of the club. You were kept outside of the temple. And so these different people groups, the, the, those that were controlling the temple, that was supposed to be a prayer for all nations, or more, most literally, the translation is all peoples, these temple authorities were pushing out and marginalizing people out of the temple worship. And Jesus says, my house should be a house of prayer for all people, all nations. So that's the first part of why Jesus says that. But then here's the second part. Jesus says, but you are making it a den of robbers. A den of robbers. This is from Jeremiah chapter 7. And in Jeremiah chapter 7, the whole story, the whole passage is from verse 411. It says, Jeremiah the prophet says, do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And God says, for if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you act justly with one another, if you do not oppress the alien or the foreigner, the orphan or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I'll dwell with you in this place, the temple, and in the land that I gave to your ancestors forever and ever. But here you are, trusting in deceptive words to no avail. What words? This is the temple of the Lord. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, other gods? 
and go, up, go after other gods that you haven't known. And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're safe here. Only to go on and doing these same things. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know I too am watching, says the Lord. Okay. So basically, the, those that were running the temple... They were using their status as a temple authority to go out and do whatever they want to exploit others and to continue to marginalize others and surround themselves with elite people who will build them up. And what is a den of robbers? The actual word there in in Hebrew and then again in Greek in the New Testament is not actually robber, it's marauder or bandit, which carries different connotation. Basically, it means someone who's robbing from others, but they're not doing the robbing in the temple. The temple was the den of the robbers. A den is some place you go to hide out. It's where you go after you've committed your atrocities and your crimes. And so he's saying that the, the people that he's talking to and he's getting frustrated about in the temple are those who come to hide in the temple. And that's the temple authorities. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees, those, depending on which group you were in, some of, them, some of them were basically taking favors from Rome for status. Others, others believed strongly in the law of the Old Testament, but to such a degree that, de- degree that they, they didn't believe anybody impure deserved to be in the temple. And so they would push away poor people and they would push away folks that you know, were deaf or blind or couldn't walk, and they would push them away out of the temple because they thought that the temple had to be so pure. Because if you, the, the more purity they had, then God would send their Messiah and deliver them from Rome, you know. And so they created all these extra rules to push folks away. And then hid out in the temple as if the t- because they did service in the temple, now that would keep them safe from God, that God wouldn't see that. And God says, Jesus says, it recalls these two stories. My house should be a house of prayer for all peoples, but you're making it a place where workers of injustice come to hide out. And then this, this, this act of overturning the temple, uh, overturning all the money changers, is basically a judgment on that entire temple system. Because Jesus is coming and he's saying that this temple no longer has significance in the eyes of God. Because what is the temple? We've talked about this before in the scriptures. Jesus refers to himself as the new temple. And he's basically this prophetic act. He's pronouncing judgment on those, because judgment can be a good thing. He's pronouncing judgment on those who were supposed to care for others, but instead were lying in their pockets, were taking favors to boost their status, and were pushing others away from God's community. This whole, and, and doing it with a temple system of, of barbaric sacrifice that came more from people than it did from God. And Jesus has come and he's declaring judgment on the attitude of the leadership, and then he's declaring judgment on the entire temple system. And that's how people saw that. And not only that, because you have, you have the, the temple authorities pushing these, these different people groups out. Children were not allowed in the temple either because children were looked at as, as, as with very low regard. You, you shut up, you learn, you listen, and you, someday you will be given honor, but you must earn it as you grow up kind of a thing. There wasn't dignity given to kids. And so um, they weren't, kids were not, they were kind of to be seen, not heard kind of a thing. Um, But in the next verses, it says, the blind and the lame came to Jesus, and the writer says, in the temple. And he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw this amazing thing, and they heard the children crying out, and they said, in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Not only are the kids and the blind and the lame and the deaf people in the temple, but they're all crying out, calling this guy the Messiah, the one whom God has sent. And the the keepers of the temple authorities, the keepers of the temple, the keepers of the system, 
they didn't like that because that's a threat to their position. And they become angry. And they say to Jesus, do you hear what's going on? As if to say, this is, they're not supposed to be in here. This is the place of God. And Jesus says, do you hear this? And Jesus says, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's like, almost like pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Knowing that that's just going to make their blood pressure go through the roof. And Jesus goes, yeah, have you never read And then he quotes Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. He says, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared place for yourself. In Psalm 8, we can put that up on the screen. He's quoting Psalm 8. And in Psalm 8, it says, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence your foe and your avenger. So these, these, Jesus is basically recalling this psalm to them and saying, look at, listen to all these crying infants and, and nursing babies and kids, you know, wink, wink. They're all singing the praises of God in the temple to silence the avenger, you guys, the temple authorities. And they just probably went oh, through the roof. And then Jesus just turns and walks out. So Jesus comes into this place and he pronounces judgment on the temple authorities for oppressing, oppressing and marginalizing people, pushing people away from the, from the kingdom and the community of God. And then he pronounces judgment on the whole system and then just walks out. That caused a huge stir. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. That would get him killed because he was insulting the entire heartbeat of the politics, of the religion, of the the economy, and the social system of ancient Israel in one short encounter. the, The amazing thing is that they didn't stone him right there, but he just gets up and walks out, and they probably were sitting there shocked of what just happened. The whole temple system that Jesus pronounced judgment on came to pass just like Jesus said later on in the scriptures because it fell in 70 AD, a few few decades after this, Rome came, burnt down the temple and the entire city of Jerusalem and the, the sacrificial system has never existed again like it had. It ended the entire system. Jesus wasn't pronouncing reform. He was completely revolutionizing the people of God. And instead of going to the temple to find mercy and forgiveness... Instead of a system of sacrifice, he's now giving them himself, his relationship. And in the place of a temple, he's creating a community of people. And he created this concept called the church, a place where people can be together through all nations, all economic statuses. No blemishes, whatever blemishes, all together into one to the kingdom of God. So this, this, this act is a prophetic act that pronounces judgment on the system of religion. Unfortunately, we try to put that back into our lives because there's something about, there's something about, uh, about creating religions out of things that brings us honor. And I'm not talking about the kind of religion where we engage in ritual and, and, and to, to comfort. That's a good thing. Jesus did a lot of that. I'm talking about the kind, of, the kind of religion where we elevate. Elevate the status of some but not others. Where we do not recognize how, how our actions affect others. Where we don't see the opinions of others where we put ourselves in the place of the hero in our stories and assume that others have bad intentions. That's the kind of religion, that's the systems of religion that keeps us up here and keeps others down here and sets us up as the smart ones and sets us up as the victors without realizing that there's a whole other world out there outside of ourselves. And in our culture right now, that's, very difficult. That's, that's a very real thing because we can all live our lives in our own little bubbles 
and we can, we can control the information that we take in to all come from the sources that comfort our and, and nurse our opinions and nurse our, our beliefs. And we can all create this, we, we create this bubble where everything that we exist in serves our viewpoints, our position in life. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you got to break out of those boxes, break out of your temples. That system is done. And now we serve others. For my house, my community will be a house for all peoples. And that is the real meaning behind Jesus driving out the money changers in the temple. All right, any questions? Class, any questions? (laughs) So that's it. That's the story. Um, the scriptures are way deeper and way rooted and interwoven and, and have roots in its own traditions. And if you don't know the culture, if you just look at it at face value, you'd just think it was Jesus doesn't like people spending money in, the, in churches or whatever. But churches are not the same as temples. Very different. The whole system is different. It might look like it in some ways, but it's very, the whole system is different. So the message of the whole thing is God welcomes all and the enemies of God push away but the community of God is open to all and like we'll like we'll experience together in just a moment the community is like a big old long table that just keeps getting bigger where we go come on join us instead of like nope sorry not pure enough Jesus condemned that system and he built a kingdom that says, come join us. Yeah, but I don't. No, you're fine. Come join us. You're good. Just come. Just come be with us. You're one of us. That's the, that's the community that Jesus built over the ashes of the temple. So let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a God who loves and includes and who doesn't exclude. You're a God who helps us process our own issues and messes to include others. You're the God that teaches us to not put ourselves at the center of our world. You also don't teach us to put others at the center of our world. You, you teach us to see our world as a sum of the parts, all of us together. You help us to see that we are part of a whole, of each other. Help us to not push things away, whether to save our own status or sense of worth or to tickle some religious belief that thinks we have to be so pure to reach God or whatever. Help us to be open and feel the pain and the discomfort that comes with knowing that we are not always the center. We're not the elite. We're one of many. We pray for that grace and that spirit and that attitude. In Jesus' name, amen.
everyone, it's me, Jody. I'm back to see you off. We hope you enjoyed your time with us today and that it was meaningful and life-giving. If you want to stay on top of things at Belgrade and know when we will be back, make sure to click the like button on Facebook or YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And be sure to hit the bell icon to get alerted when the next episode of Belgrade Online is available. Until next time, I'm Jody. Thank you for watching and have a great week.